We are um, an institute, the World Resource Institute, that seeks to intermediate between this amazing data and the decision maker, if you like. And I just want to give you a few examples of that. The United States made a decision that is as, is as important as the technological advances, and that is we are going to have open access data. And virtually everything I'll show you today is actually free. And that is an amazing thing. And now other countries, of course, are sharing this. Better data, better decisions. But first, let's just ask ourselves, why, do we, why are we concerned? Uh, well, the human footprint is growing very dramatically. This is in real terms. And just in the next 20 years, we will almost certainly see another doubling of the human economic footprint. Now, this is very good news um, because uh, it's resulted in the biggest reduction in poverty in the history of the world. Never have we had two decades like we've just had where poverty has halved, and that is terribly good news. And it's an important theme this year of the Sustainable Development Goals. And of course, we've also seen that as people become less poor, they enter the middle class where used to be one billion in the middle class. It's two billion. It'll be up to five billion between 2030 and 2040. Again, very good news. When you enter the middle class, you use more energy, you buy more stuff, and especially you like to uh, purchase these. And uh, this puts a big pressure on the global environment, and it costs quite a bit in terms of human and economics. In addition to that, because we have more people, because they are wealthier, we are going to need to increase food consumption by about 70% between 2005 and 2050. This will require a rate of growth of food production greater than we've managed in the past, at a time when risks are growing. So what I would like to do is just give three examples here of, of how we use this kind of data in forests, in water, and in greenhouse gas emissions. And I'll say just a small word about the third, mainly on the first and second. So in the old days, um, people really had a hard time knowing what was going on. You could get data on deforestation, but it was usually four years out of date, and it came in a big, uh, fat book. As a result of that, every single minute of every single day, uh, we've been losing 50 soccer fields. We've lost an area that is three times the size of Germany. And that's in large part because we didn't know, believe it or not. And so recently, we put together a partnership together with 60 institutions led by the World Resources Institute, but drawing upon scientific expertise from all around the world, private sector expertise like Google and Esri and Digital Globe. And it uses precisely the kind of thing that, uh, that Kathy was talking about. Amazing advances in satellite technology incredible advances in cloud computing, and amazing advances in digitalization, in communications, visualization, so that everyone on the planet can now know what is happening down to a 100 meter or 200 meter level, updated every three weeks. And three years from now, it'll be even more rapid, but it's not only satellites that give us data, it's citizens around the world where anybody with a GPS-linked smartphone can take a picture, write a story, and it gets uploaded. So it's the top-down, the bottom-up, transformative database. And so you can see we can measure it monthly, but this shows yearly data as deforestation takes place through the last decade. And you see that there's quite a bit of red as trees are, tr are cut down. And much of that is fine because it comes from plantations and that is entirely appropriate. But in many places, it comes from forests that nobody wants to actually cut down. So consider, for example, um, palm oil. It's by far the biggest cause of deforestation in Southeast Asia. Today, we met with many of the major palm oil uh, commodity uh, traders and producers and uh, consumers. They're all committed to do the right thing, almost all of them now. But until recently, they haven't had a way of actually knowing. Now what we can do for Indonesia or anywhere else in the world, we can narrow down and we know where the uh, oil palm concessions are. And we can then ask the question, what's actually happening uh, to the forest areas? And 
we can put on national parks here and we can start seeing that actually deforestation is happening outside where it's allowed, in illegal areas. And then we can ask the question, well, let's go and look at some of these areas where clearly this shouldn't be taking place. And we can look at it in very great uh, detail. And we can then actually, because we now have the data, at least for Indonesia, of which companies actually have uh, which concessions. So what do you do with that information? Well, what Unilever is doing is saying, we're committed to deforestation-free purchasing of palm oil. So any company that's misbehaving like that, that is built into the software that we use to purchase oil palm. So a transformative um, development. So too, a major problem, as you know, in uh, Indonesia and Southeast Asia is fires caused deliberately to clear land and causing huge environmental and human costs. Last year, schools in Singapore had to be closed down because of what was happening in Sumatra. So what we can do now, we can actually see these fires as they develop, and we can analyze them, and then we can ask a commercial satellite producer, Digital Globe, and we can look at it in much, much more detail. We can go down to one half of a meter, and we can look at precisely what's happening here, and we can ask, how did it happen, and who's responsible for it? And this is very important um, for two reasons. One, it enables the response to be much quicker. So here, for example, just in the last year, we've seen a reduction in response time by over 80% because the Indonesian government developed this with us, and they are now using this. And so this prevents fires from spreading. In addition to that, we can use it uh, to, to actually help countries prosecute the bad guys. Singapore doesn't want to have to close its schools, so it passed a law this last year that enabled prosecutions to take place. And this data can be used very much, by the way, with the blessing of Indonesia, because it wants to do the right thing. But in addition to that, journalists, communities can all use this data. This is an example. We've now had many, many stories that have come out where journalists wouldn't have known where deforestation was taking place. They now do. They're able to write stories and go to the right place. We live in a, in a transformative time. The good news is it's not only deforestation that this can measure. We're starting to be able to get the ability to measure reforestation. Harder to do, and it takes more time. But what we're seeing is that there is now a, a, a revolution that is incipient, getting underway, to uh, ask the question, why do we allow two billion hectares of the world, which we've mapped, that, that are degraded, why do we allow that wonderful natural capital to go to waste? Twice the size of China, wouldn't it be smart to actually invest in that, restore it to good agriculture, restore it to uh, forests? And so we've had this uh, wonderful commitment made at the Secretary General's summit in September, 350 million hectares would be restored by 2030. And so what we seeing is countries now are coming forward and saying, we now get it. We, um, here's Latin American countries. Just last month, eight uh, Latin American countries at the Lima COP came forward and said, count us in for 20 million hectares. Here's the important point. Private investors came to the table and said, look, we are willing to put in uh, up to $365 million. And over time, and here's the point I want to make, over time we'll be using uh, remote sensing to enable us to see this happening, hold each other accountable, and before long we'll be able to use it for carbon markets because the development that is now very much on the horizon is not only to see almost every tree from satellites, but in addition to that to know how much carbon is in each tree. So you can imagine a situation in which uh, those uh, countries that want to compensate other countries for protecting their forests or from, for restoring their forests will be able to do this very, very easily. Let me move on quickly to water risk. Um, about four years ago, a, a, a few companies, Goldman Sachs, um, GE, Shell, came to us and they said, we're concerned about water risk, but what is it? Water risk is very location specific. How do we get a handle on it? We look at the 15,000 major aquifers in the world and using modeling techniques and remote sensing, 
uh, we are able to show uh, just where the risk is greatest. We have 12 different indicators, both quantity and quality uh, of water. It's called aqueduct. And as a result of this, and because private companies now recognize that water is a very serious commercial risk, as shown by the risk assessment that, remember, the World Economic Forum does every year, water, the number one risk. So dozens and dozens of companies are now using this technique to measure water risk. And just a couple of months ago, the Bloomberg terminals said, you know, we're getting such a lot of interest from our clients on water risk. We want to actually put this data uh, on the terminals. And, and it's not because we're environmentalists. It's because this is about good business decisions. So all of a sudden, 300,000 investors are getting access to water risk data. And what we can do with this is uh, not only for a company, but for a country as well, we can ask the question, well, it's interesting, in South Asia, the average hectare of rice uh, currently feeds uh, about uh, 26 people. By the year 2050, it'll probably have to feed about 40 people at a time when water risk is growing. This helps you think through the ir irrigation strategy, helps you think through food security and so on to empower decisions. So too, for example, um, look at energy. This is, this is a map for China of the water risk, looking at all of their, their aquifers. You can ask the question, well, um, where is the coal going to be mined? And um, how much co water do we need for a, co a coal power plant? So the Chinese government's now using this model in order to help them think through uh, energy security issues as they certainly should. We've done this work overlaying on shale worldwide, and you see that about 40% of all the shale that we know exists, shale gas in the, in the world, is actually in pretty high stressed areas. And therefore, don't count on it to provide the energy security that we'd all hoped for. And so we can go down at a, a great deal of here, here's the data, um, a great deal of detail, and see exactly um, what is going on. For the future, in a couple of months, we are going to launch these same maps, but using projections. Taking the IPCC scenarios, we're able then to take this quite sophisticated analysis, again from remote sensing and from ground data, and we're able to project what would happen, not today, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 30 years from now, and so on. And that, in turn, is going to be pretty transformative in the way we look at food security, energy security, and our way of life. Cities around the world are also now taking this data very, very seriously. Just a, a final word on um, greenhouse gas emissions. I think uh, everybody knows that uh, uh, climate change is a, a, a very, very serious issue. Uh, until 10 years ago, we really didn't know terribly well how to measure greenhouse gases. Over the last 10 or, 10 or 15 years, We've developed a, a, a quite a sophisticated way to measure at the country, company, and now city level. And you can go to databases that we and others run, and you can look at the national level and so on, and you can look at the company level too. And this is very good. There's now sort of very comprehensive, agreed approaches. Um, and uh, that is now used in negotiations, and it's very important. Uh, a recent development uh, in, in Lima just last month, we all agreed on a common protocol for cities to measure their greenhouse gases. And this is important because almost 300 major cities have now signed up to the Compact of Mayors, which says we are going to, on an annual basis, be transparent about the greenhouse gases we emit. We're going to have targets, and we're going to hold ourselves accountable to achieve them. So this was very good news. Um, but this is all measured from Earth at the moment. And an interesting development is, when will we be able to have data from remote sensing that will enable us to know in some detail? Now, there is, as Kathy said, there is a, a, a carbon observatory that's now um, circling the Earth that can, for the first time ever, measure columns of, of carbon dioxide. Uh, and so this potentially will be a real game changer. As I said before, very soon we'll be able to do it with forests, um, and that will enable us really to know at a great deal of detail 
exactly what's happening to greenhouse gases. So this is a, a, a very major issue for us. In terms of what's next more broadly, let me just make a couple of final points here. Um, Kathy made the point that satellites don't solve problems for us. They don't actually even give us information. They give us data which has to be turned into information, which has to be then made available in a way that decision makers can do something about it. And the trick is to bring to decision makers the right mix of data. This merges data from, uh, from satellites together with data, a huge amount of data from on the ground, and then overlaying it so that decision makers can make the right decision. Second sort of closing point I wanted to make is that we tend to think this is just for very sophisticated you know, people and groups and economies. This is a, a city in, in India, and these are the auto rickshaws. They all now have GPSs, and as a result of that, they are able to be instructed to go where they're more likely to get a, a, a ride. Consequently, we can now track the fact that they can use satellite information gets them more money, um, it gets people to work quicker, it reduces congestion, and is generally a beneficial thing. And there are thousands of such examples, of course. Um, just let me close, though, at the other end of the sophistication scale, where I think you probably know in New York City, for example, 10,000 internet hotspots are about to be established in New York City. Combined with developers like uh, Stephen Ross, who is currently putting together the most, uh, uh, well, the largest uh, real estate private development in the history of the United States, Hudson's Yards, um, which will be the most monitored piece of real estate in the world. Everything from vibration to carbon emissions to energy to traffic, uh, which combined also with a lot of satellite data will enable um, uh, it to have an environmental footprint much, much less. Let me conclude, we believe that better data, better decisions, a better future. Thank you very much.